the American way. American preeminence is a fact. People who believe American power is there to be used. We're very unabashed about uh, using American force. Who are talking about a new world war. They will say, you make us very nervous. And our response should be good. They call themselves neoconservatives, right-wing thinkers whose dreams of a new American century have become George Bush's foreign policy. The President of the United States, um, uh, on issue after issue, has reflected uh, the thinking of neoconservatives. What's new about the neocons thinking they believe America's military might should promote America's ideals. American power should be used not just in the defense of American interests, but for the promotion of American principles. Throughout the war, we were with the neocons in Washington, going behind the scenes. I'm going to get a monkey to go with it. Finding out what makes them tick. I'm a student of Machiavelli. I wrote a book on Machiavelli. And I know the struggle against evil is going to go on forever. And what the neocons have in store for us now. We're going to have to bring down a series of regimes who are the sponsors of a network of various terrorist organizations. Syria. Saudi Arabia. Iran. North Korea. And then there's Libya. Tonight, will America's superhawks drag us into more wars against their enemies? Washington, the city where war was planned, awaits the first shots. The deadline to Sudan is about to expire. Outside the White House, a last-minute protest against the war and against the people they claim are pushing it. Richard Pearl, get him out of office. Richard Pearl, out of office. Inside the White House, the president and his advisors are debating whether to launch what they call a decapitation strike. They've had an intelligence tip-off. Saddam has been seen in a Baghdad suburb. Nowhere in this city of power is war awaited with more anxiety and enthusiasm than here in 17th Street. On the top three floors, the American Enterprise Institute, home to some of the top neoconservative thinkers who sold the president a more aggressive view of America's role in the world, one that's about to be tested in Iraq. Now, this place really is the, the ideas factory, the ideological engine room of the Bush administration. Hello. Meet neoconservative writer and thinker David Frum. He's very cautious. He's a former top Bush speechwriter and an AEI scholar, as they're known. He helped coin the phrase axis of evil, which President Bush used to condemn Iraq, North Korea, and Iran as sponsors of terrorism. David Frum left to write a book about a president he says is sometimes ill-informed, but makes the right decisions. Uh, president Bush gave the Axis of Evil speech 13 months, 14 months ago. So this is being done deliberately. Uh, like everyone in the AEI, David Frum is waiting to hear whether war against the first country in his Axis of Evil has finally begun. And when we hear the news later this evening or tomorrow morning, what do you think you're going to feel, what do you think? Um, I, I, I'm going to feel... Um, when I hear that news, uh, uh, I mean, I'm going to pray, as we all do, uh, for the success of American arms. Uh, I'm going to uh, pray for low casualties on all sides, uh, for the swift overthrow of this dictator. Um, I'm going to feel some fear, of course, because people are in danger, and they are in harm's way. Um, but mostly I'm going to feel confidence, because I think the war is just. Um, I think America is going to win. I think um, the West, the whole West is going to benefit. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from great danger. The neocons may have helped inspire the war, but they also inspire suspicion in Washington. They're hawks, and they've had those plans set out for quite a while, I believe. To me, it seems like there's something, there's another agenda that we're not really privy to with all of this, and that is what concerns me most. Washington's most neocon paper churns out the story. The war's begun, 
and so perhaps is the neoconservative way of running the world. You must see this as an important moment for you, that there's something at stake for you neoconservatives here. Sure. There is a lot at stake. Our ideas are being put to the test. We are aware of the fact that we are influencing the lives of mi millions of people with our ideas. Our ideas are being tested. The next morning, Washington at war. No worries yet on the TV news. Right. Time for a walk on the wild side with ultra-near conservative Michael Ledeen. He's been called a mysterious ideological adventurer. In the 70s, he was involved in the shadowy world of right-wing Italian politics. In the 80s, his secret meetings with the Israeli government led, inadvertently, he says, to the notorious Iran-Contra affair. Second day of the war, and Michael Ledeen's about to go on TV, talking about more regimes to topple. This is a conflict between freedom and tyranny. The, well, we're fighting tyrants. I believe that if the tyrants are removed, that there'll be a great deal more peace and chances for peace in the Middle East. And the tyrants, if you can name names. Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Saudi Arabia are the big four. And then there's Libya. There's a, there's a North Korean problem, too, that we'll have to deal with, although that's not directly related to the Middle East, except insofar as North Korea's helped them. You can't solve all problems, I grant that. I mean, I'm, I'm a student of Machiavelli. I wrote a book on Machiavelli. And I know the struggle against evil is going to go on forever. Could you give me a mic check, please? Uh, yes, this is a mic check. Post 9-11, Michael Ledeen's shadowy neocon talents are back in favor. He's listened to in the Pentagon, and it seems the White House. The Washington Post recently reported he's an advisor to White House political guru, Karl Rove. Okay, guys. Hello, it's Michael. In Washington's National Press Center, journalist Jim Loeb's become a neocon anorak, compiling files on them since the 70s where he realized how influential they could become. Michael Ledeen, a particular source of fascination. He's supposed to brief the White House as well. Or... Yeah, he, I was, people were very surprised to see that of, of uh, all the people who Karl Rove, his closest advisor, talks to very few people who are knowledgeable in foreign affairs. Very few, like a handful. But one of them is Michael Ledeen. And, you know, that would be cause for sleepless nights for many people, I would think. He is a provocateur, uh, and he's written more than once that um, the thing he really dislikes about, about foreign policy establishment is that they, they prefer stability as opposed to revolution or radical change. Friday morning, key neoconservatives gather at the American Enterprise Institute to explain to the world the neocon view of the war. It's what they call a black coffee briefing. Michael Ledeen's here to insist Iraq must be part of a campaign to bring democracy to the Middle East. The neocons say democracies don't harbor international terrorists. Also here, the man who's been called the neocon's political godfather, Richard Pearl. He's the former Reagan official who's now a key figure on the Pentagon's civilian advisory board. Over a hundred diplomats and reporters crowd in to get their inside and often unguarded views. I don't think we're vindictive. I really don't. Richard doesn't think Americans are vindictive. Well, I hope he's wrong. <laughs> Have you thought some how it's going? Well, it's, it's going well. Uh, it's <laughs> premature to say it's over. It isn't over. It's hard to overestimate the American Enterprise Institute's influence. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. It's helped give George Bush's administration its current ideology. At the American Enterprise Institute, some of the finest minds in our nation are at work in some of the greatest challenges to our nation. You do such good work that my administration has borrowed 20 such minds. The, 
President of the United States um, uh, on issue after issue has reflected uh, the thinking of neoconservatives. I think he comes at his view um, in his own way and through his own experience, but it happens to track very closely with the outlook of neoconservatives, especially since September 11. The neocon future has also been plotted five floors below the AI in the offices of the Weekly Standard and its editor, William Crystal. The dream of sorting out Saddam, one way or another, has haunted him for years. Okay, so you've got him over here. Right, this art was done for a cover piece in the Weekly Standard by David Brooks. You've got him in the box. The piece was called Saddam's Brain. You're not obsessed with You're not obsessed with No, no, this was given to me as a birthday present on my 50th birthday by my colleagues here at the Weekly Standard. Think he's still alive? Uh, I'm afraid so, but maybe not too much longer. Bill Crystal was chief of staff to the vice president in George Bush Sr.'s White House. He was once called Dan Quayle's brain. But he believes George Bush Sr. wimped out by not toppling Saddam in the 91 Gulf War. Now he's chair of perhaps the most hardcore neocon think tank, the revealingly titled Project for the New American Century. Its mission, to shape a new century favorable to American principles and interests. Project for the New American Century involves Richard Warmonger. Pearl, Dick Cheney, Elliot Abrams, Donald Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz. Paul Wolfowitz. These are only five of the names. Jeb Bush. All these people. Everybody knows about the Project for the New American Century. You're all going to go home and check it on the web, right? What it does is outline a doctrine for United States imperialism. Not even neo-imperialism. Bonafide old school imperialism. In 1998, the Project for the New American Century wrote to President Clinton, urging removing Saddam's regime from power. Eighteen people signed, half now in the administration, including Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and his influential deputy, Paul Wolfowitz. Preemptive action, regime change, after 9-11, those neocon policies were just what George Bush was looking for. George Bush's current foreign policy is basically a neoconservative foreign policy in the sense that he believes that American power is crucial to the uh, promotion of liberty and democracy around the world. 9-11 was a huge uh, wake-up call, uh, reality impinged, and the president decided, in my view correctly, that to simply stand back and let things develop around the world was a recipe for more 9-11s, was a recipe for death and for tyranny uh, prevailing, and, and that we had to be active in the world. The world. majority of the world opposes this war and is looking at the United States going, oh my God, how can they let it happen? How can this happen in our name? And it sits here and happens, but not in our name. 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 Meet neoconservative Mayrav Wormza. She founded a charity that monitors the Arab press for anti-Semitic opinions. Her husband, David, is an advisor at the State Department, one of those mines the president borrowed from the AEI. She's part of a group of neocons who've been particularly influential post 9-11 because they specialize in the Middle East. You have a story here about ideas and love among people. And, it, and it's true, and I'm not, I'm not being cynical about it. It's, it's real, fundamental love and, um, and power, because some of those ideas make policy, and some of the people in the group are policy makers. And um, we function and we view ourselves as a group, and we will all stand for each other in defense of each other all the way. And we view ourselves as a group, and we will all stand for each other in defense of each other all the way. USA! 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 You know, the people that are protesting against the war in Iraq, they really don't know what they're talking about. First Sunday of the war, and America's pro-war majority makes its voice heard. It's also a day for reflection.
Religion is important to the neoconservatives. It honors tradition, obedience, and makes you think about good and evil. Things that also, we're told, matter to George Bush. Our own weapons, these precise and devastating bombs, have been shocking and awesome. Their critics say the neoconservatives are wrong to look at the world as if it's a battle between moral extremes. The problem with the neocons is that um, every time the U.S. gets tested, it's a question of freedom versus tyranny. And there's really kind of nothing in between. And of course, it never exactly turns out that way because the world is a lot more complicated. But the neoconservative hawks say history shows there really is good and evil, especially the history of Europe in the last century. The appeasement of Nazi Germany that led to the Holocaust hovers over their view of the world and its dark possibilities. For those of us who are involved in foreign and defense policy today, my generation, the defining moment of our history was certainly the, the Holocaust. It was the destruction, the genocide of a whole people. And it was the failure to respond in a timely fashion to a threat that was clearly gathering. Um, we don't want that to happen again. When we have the ability to stop uh, totalitarian regimes, we should do so. Because when we fail to do so, the results uh, are catastrophic. 20th century Europe said never again then failed to save the Muslims of Bosnia. It was American power, the neocons like to say, that finally ended the Balkan horror. The failure to deal with Bosnia decisively and early was a defining moment for a lot of neoconservatives and, and some others as well. Nobody was prepared to take serious action in Bosnia until we did. The fact is that uh, uh, the world tends to look the other way, and we don't. On 17th Street, the protesters are zeroing in on the neocons HQ. Inside, the American Enterprise Institute's latest black coffee briefing. Michael Ledeen, unapologetic about America's shock and awe uh, tactics. But, uh, all the great scholars who have studied American character uh, have come to the conclusion that we are a warlike people and that we love war. No one would have imagined that the United States uh, could and maybe should consider France and Germany to be strategic enemies. And yet they have behaved now for several months as if they were strategic enemies. The Michael Ledeen raises the stakes, as does Pentagon and advisor James Woolsey. And we are going to have to be involved for the next, I think, several decades in helping change the face of the Middle East. By now, we picked up a recurrent theme of insider talk in Washington. Some leading neocons, people whisper, are strongly pro-Zionist and want to topple regimes in the Middle East to help Israel as well as the U.S. In Washington, this is a highly sensitive issue. One to take to Jim Loeb, veteran neocon watcher and long-standing opponent of anti-Semitism. I, I, I was sitting in a bar in Capitol Hill and I was told by a congressional staffer, careful how you use the word neoconservative. People might think you're being anti-Semitic. Can you just explain this for me? I mean, it's no secret. The majority of neoconservatives have been and remain Jewish. That is a fact. They are not, they do not represent a majority of the American Jewish community. But do you think it's legitimate to talk about the pro-Israeli politics of some of the neoconservatives? Well, I think it's very difficult to understand them if you don't begin at that point. I mean, I should think people would want to talk about that rather openly because it, to the extent that you suppress it, and I think there is an attempt by some to suppress it, I think then it festers. In 1996, a group of neocons wrote a report intended as advice for incoming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It called for a clean break with the peace process, rolling back Syria and removing Saddam Hussein from power, an important Israeli strategic objective in its own right. Amongst those who contributed, Richard Pearl, Douglas Fife, now number three at the Pentagon, David Wormser, now in the State Department, and Mayrav Wormser. It was no more than a mental exercise done in a think tank um, 
uh, by a group of people. Um, yes, many of us are Jewish. There's no need to apologize for that. Um, uh, most of us, all of us, in fact, are pro-Israel. Uh, some of us more fiercely so than, the, than, than others, but we have no problem also criticizing Israel. That, that paper in 1996, the, the King Break paper, that was the paper that led to uh, accusations of, of dual loyalty. There is no dual loyalty. Uh, the people in the group are Americans, first and foremost. Um, and uh, view themselves as American thinkers and as people who are most interested in American policy. We see a tremendous uh, similarity um, between Israel and America, and Britain for that matter, uh, simply because these are leading democracies. In the case of Israel, it's the only democracy in the Middle East. Live from the front line. On TV, signs the advance is slowing. Charges of dual loyalty touch on raw emotions. Professor Elliot Cohen is one of America's top military historians. We met as the progress of the war seemed in the balance. In an narrow military sense, the achievements look you know, pretty remarkable. Uh, you know, 50 miles outside Baghdad, a lot of bad things that could have happened haven't happened yet. Professor Cohen is also an advisor to the Pentagon and has been involved with both the AEI and the project for the new American century. You've expressed some concern over the idea that this is all a conspiracy whipped up by a group of, quotes neoconservative hawks who are somehow allied to Israel, and you've expressed well, worries about that. Ex explain what you're concerned about. Look, sometimes the word neoconservative is used when what they really would like to say is Jew. They being? People who use that kind of language. And as a Jew, I found it offensive. There are two things that are um, despicable about it. The first is the imputation of dual loyalties. Um, Between America and Israel. Right. Uh, and, and just speaking as somebody whose father served in the United States Army, who served in the United States Army himself, who was the son serving in the United States Army, I find it deeply, deeply offensive and untrue. And the other thing that I find deeply offensive about it is it contains a very old anti-Semitic canard, which is that the Jews, this scattered little people around the world have these occult powers and are pulling the strings of the naive and duped non-Jews. And it wasn't long, that long ago that those kinds of beliefs led to hideous things which impinged upon people like me very directly. So yes, I feel very strongly about it. Iraq will be disarmed. The Iraqi regime will be ended, and the long-suffering Iraqi people will be free. Again, it's the same In decades of oppression, the Iraqi regime has sought to... Same soundbite from the president, but today a chance for Tony Blair to make the TV headlines in America. There is a massive amount that has already been achieved. Do you think Tony Blair has anything in common with their conservatives? I, I think Tony Blair's uh, um, moral sense is uh, very much reflected in the thinking of many neoconservatives. I, I suppose he'd be horrified to hear that, especially since the term neoconservative is uh, uh, so abused. But uh, his sense that it was right to liberate uh, Iraq is the sense of neoconservatives and was not the view of uh, uh, most foreign offices, including probably his own. Nine days in, news from Iraq raises fears of a longer war. Bad news for neoconservatives who helped make out the case for the conflict. The story that I just wrote said, neocon nosedive, with a question mark. Neocon nosedive? Uh, yeah. It has a certain alliteration. And, and tell me why. Tell me why. Well, because again, they're the ones who said, essentially, this would be a cakewalk, this would be easy. We'd see tens of thousands of uh, Iraqi soldiers surrendering. We'd see people rising up all over the place in joy to, to greet you know, their liberators and so on. And we haven't seen it yet. On Fox TV, on Fox TV where neocon Bill Crystal's a pundit, it all looks different. Fox has a cheerleading tone. 
They're doing fine, Linda, and you know the media does not reflect the country. Some people in Washington are saying this is a neoconservative war, and so far there's no sign it's working. The regime isn't, isn't crumbling. What do you say? I'd say it's an American war. Like Bill Crystal's magazine, Fox TV is part of Rupert Murdoch's media empire. The neocons have been backed by entrepreneurs, corporations, and rich right-wing foundations, which has led some to claim they're being used to export not democracy, but capitalism. Some people said, look, um, neoconservative ideology, fine, but what you're really doing is making the world safe for capitalism. You know, you're backed by Mr. Murdoch, Fox TV. Um, front for capitalism? No, I mean, not in my case. I'm much more interested in liberty and democracy than I am in capitalism. Yeah, I was once a social democrat, sort of, and I had, no, oh, look, social democracy is fine. It's about freedom and liberty, freedom and democracy. It's not about capitalism. Back in the 60s, Joshua Moravchek of the American Enterprise Institute was even further to the left. It was the journey people like him made to the political right that earned them the label new or neoconservatives, intended as an insult, but one they took up as a badge of honor. Old political loyalties to Democrat colleagues of the past still linger. Like Richard Pearl, Joshua Moravchek is still a Democrat. I think it's very relevant that uh, virtually all neoconservatives come out of the left, some the liberal left, some the radical left, as I myself uh, did. I grew up in the civil rights movement fighting against uh, discrimination and, and, and segregation, and uh, I think I brought some of that same spirit to fighting against communism when I came to the view that that was uh, the world's uh, chief, chief evil, and uh, today to fighting against uh, terrorism and uh, Islamic extremism. Uh, and I think it also it, it, it gives us a certain uh, uh, flair for the ideological uh, battle. We're not unhappy with it. We want to take on our opponents. Tonight, how the day unfolded. On TV, the more skeptical newscasts are talking of a quagmire. Today. What do you think of that? Is that, is that a great that toe? Right? That's my self. <laughs> I'm going to get a monkey to go with it. Hello? Yes. Richard Pearl's in a Washington studio for that Sunday's panorama. His good humor belies the fact there's more bad news for the neocon cause. He's just resigned as chairman of the Pentagon's Defense Policy Board, though he's still a member. There have been allegations of a conflict of interest over a business deal, charges he strongly rejects. I'm joined from Washington by Richard Pearl, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense, who's been described by some newspapers as the architect of the Iraq War. What will happen if, at the end of the war, the Americans do not find any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? Well, I believe that the liberation of Iraq, the freeing of the Iraqi people, uh, would be justification enough. How did you feel about being called the architect of the war? Well, I, I, I mean, there's hardly a point in denying it. It isn't true, of course. But... And as far as the planning is concerned, I had nothing whatever to do with that. Nothing. Do you think the influence of the new conservatives in the Pentagon is going to be weakened by resignation? At all. Certainly hope not. The Pentagon, the Pentagon is in good hands. And that will be evident when this is over. I think it's evident already, but it will certainly be evident when it's over. The U.S. Department of Defense is the neoconservative stronghold. Paul Wolfowitz, the number two there, and fellow neocon Douglas Fife, the number three. At the more dovish State Department, neocon John Bolton is in charge of arms control. At the National Security Council, there's Elliot Abrams, the president's Near East advisor. National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and Vice President Dick Cheney are not neocon intellectuals, perhaps, but certainly political allies. That Sunday, a meeting of the pro-Israel lobby, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. Syria also now faces a critical choice. Even Secretary of State Colin Powell, who's quietly opposed much of the neocon agenda, is starting to use neocon language. Syria bears the responsibility for its choices and for the consequences. The real symbol of, of opposition, so to speak, is Secretary of State Powell. So if Secretary of State Powell goes, that'll be game, set, and match to the neoconservatives. 
Uh, well, I would say game, set, and match would be to win him over to our side. More worrying news from Iraq. Dog days for the neocons, though they seem unperturbed. We're talking, I think, on day 12 of the war, something like that, and... Uh, you know, it would be instructive, I think, to go back to day 12 of the first Gulf War, day 12 of Kosovo, day 12 of Afghanistan, and see how, see both how far along people were, and the extent to which people were already, people, people in the press today, right, were already reaching for quagmire and debacle and disaster and, and all the rest. Professor Cohen's old pal and college dean was Paul Wolfowitz. The Deputy Defense Secretary is the man who brought neocon philosophy into the heart of the U.S. administration, a philosophy of exporting democracy in the interests of defending America. What is distinctive about his worldview, which has been influential, is that it is, it's a very interesting blending of, in some ways, rather old-fashioned realpolitik, if you will, a tough-minded view of the world, with on the other hand, a certain kind of American democratic idealism. That's very unusual. That's really very unusual. And, and that, that's the, that synthesis at the moment, I think, is, is intellectually dominant. But I have no idea whether it will survive this war or not. Now, with a panel of world-class military and political experts and scholars, Here's Chris Kaur. And very familiar voices and faces at the microphones tonight. Harlan of course, some neocons, like Michael Ledeen, but even exporting democracy rather more aggressively than others. I'm just the moderator. Thank you for joining us. I'll ask it this way of you, Michael, that, you know, uh, how many of these, you better watch it, we're coming after you, can we do at once? We're going to have to bring down a series of regimes who are the sponsors of a network of various terrorist organizations. And Iraq is part of it. It was Elliot Cohen who gave this neocon campaign a name. He sees the Cold War against communism as World War III and the conflict with what he calls militant Islam as World War IV. And so he said World War IV is somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but it, as a way of capturing the fact that, uh, I mean, I believe we are locked in a long-term war with the radicalized branches of Islam, which are deeply hostile to the United States, but I think more broadly to the West. You have a very large phenomenon, which is very difficult to figure out how to, um, how to beat, um, which, is, which, 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 which is capable, really, of inflicting catastrophic damage, not just to our cities, but to yours. As the coalition approaches Baghdad, George Bush's White House has kept faith with the hardline neocons. But what do the rest of America's conservative movement make of them? Rallies as well. um, I was asked this morning to give an update on the uh, support of the troops rallies around the United States. To find out, we got an invite to one of the mainstream conservative rights' private weekly meetings. Here, conservative lobbyists from across the U.S. plot the week's business. To liaise with them, there's a man from the White House. Effects. Is somebody voting against us because they're a union member, or are they voting against us because they're a government employee? Many traditional conservatives are suspicious of the neocon cuckoos in their nest. They don't like America being embroiled in foreign adventures. And then there's the Middle East problem. They are entitled to their opinions, but when it gets to Arab bashing, general Arab bashing, I think they take it too far. I think they're a disaster for this country. And many members of Congress believe that, but they don't dare say it. But they'll take on everyone. It's like a gang. You know, it's like mafia. But are you a mafia? <laughs> that is so uh, absurd. Mafia? Do you recognize any um, any gang mafia? You know, yeah. No, I, I, I. I'm. I usually have a response to statements like that, but I don't understand the statement, frankly. Uh, I don't know what power to intimidate where it's suggested that we have. Media? We, on the media? We, we say what we think. We're the very opposite of the kind of clandestineness one associates with the mafia. I think what rubs people wrong about us is that we're so out front and audacious about saying things that, are, that, that go against the grain. 
Some of Washington's right-wing insiders are so irritated with their neocon colleagues, they like to dispute whether the White House is really influenced by them at all. Some intellectuals have run around saying, and let's have a war with, and they've listed 11 countries, okay? Um, and because in the 11 was included Iraq, they've also gone around going, because the cock crowed, the sun went up. As opposed to taking a look and saying, this government and this president, we're going to hit Iraq. We're going to hit the Taliban, regardless of what some people wrote in newspaper columns. If, now, if I'm wrong, and the United States government invades Iran and Saudi Arabia and Egypt and decides to run a 30-year holy war uh, against the Muslim and Arab world, uh, then seven uh, writers did, in fact, pull the president around by the nose. We don't claim credit for it at all. Um, you could say that our power is a figment of our enemy's imagination. It might be absolutely true. Uh, we are not claiming to be running the world. Uh, our job is just to think. And if our ideas get adopted, and if our ideas turn into policy, wonderful. That's what we're here for. Suddenly, more optimistic news from Iraq, and the neocons are ramping up the rhetoric. We will make a lot of people very nervous. And we will hear, for example, the Mubarak regime in Egypt, or the Saudi royal family, thinking about this idea that these Americans are spreading a democracy in this part of the world. They will say, you make us very nervous. And our response should be good. Going too far? No. Uh, the Iranians and the Syrians uh, are even more nervous than the um, Saudis and Egyptians at this very moment. Um, Syria is making, you know, and the you know, Syrian regime is making comments that they're nervous, that they think that they're next. So, are the Syrians worried? I went to their embassy to ask whether they took much notice of the neoconservatives. Do they go to those American Enterprise Institute briefings? Oh yes, I try to attend almost all their public meetings. Sometimes I, 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 I find them amusing. Sometimes they are really terrifying in the way they think, the way they would like to shape the world, the way they think they can impose their doctrine and their ideology on everybody else, even if force is needed. You worried? No, we are not worried at all. We have our alliances, we have our friends, but I don't think they have any chance whatsoever of uh, translating this agenda into policies. By now, I've been round other embassies in Washington, gathering some startled private comments about the neoconservatives. Washington's state diplomatic community taken aback by the neocons' aggressive view of America's role in the world. Uh, here's what some diplomats and foreign embassies have had to say off the record about neoconservatives. We're flabbergasted. They've hijacked the administration. We've commissioned a report on neoconservatives, and it's a bestseller in the embassy. And this really is a revolution in foreign policy. We've seen nothing like it before. Triumph on the screen, and for the neoconservatives, for whom the long-awaited fall of Saddam is just an opening episode in the new American century. Just tell me what you felt, what you thought when you saw that statue of Saddam coming down. Well, I, I did something that uh, always looks absurd when other people do it. I applauded the television set. It was a moment of... Uh, just underscored and reminded us that that freedom is an enduring ideal everywhere and not just in the Western world everywhere this was a dream that Mayor of Wormser and her husband David now at the State Department had cherished as long as anyone in Washington we actually opened a bottle of champagne this was a moment we waited for for many many years I mean we've been working on freedom for Iraq for the past nine years maybe my personal feeling was doing, you know, an incredibly good deed by pushing this war because, you know, people got their freedom out of it. Jim. Hi. Okay. So the statues are coming down. 
That's correct. How strong a yes. position is this going to leave the neocons in Washington? Um, quite strong. Much stronger than they were two weeks ago when they were so glum. Their position has strengthened. But at the same time, they become ever more visible. They've never had the prominence that they have at the present moment. Never. And I think that makes them feel both a little giddy and uh, a little anxious. Let's see what happens next. Just it's a never-ending drama here in Washington. Good morning. To the neocons, the images of victorious American power showed their ideas are working. They say they don't want to declare war on the world for democracy and hope other regimes can be changed by politics and pressure. But they rarely rule force out. And welcome to today on this Joshua Moravchek has his sights on another regime in the axis of evil. North Korea. It's reported to have a weapons-grade nuclear program. He says diplomacy is unlikely to work. So how far would you go? Well, uh, that, that might include having to uh, try to destroy it by, by military strikes. But that would lead to war, wouldn't it, on the Korean Peninsula? There's uh, danger it would lead to war. Far worse than, than in Iraq? It would be far worse than in Iraq. It would be a war in which uh, thousands and thousands uh, of Koreans would die and maybe thousands of Americans as well. The United States foreign policy has essentially been hijacked by a group of neoconservatives. Victory Weekend, America's anti-war activists, still a minority, gather in Washington. Too late to stop this war, but not perhaps the others they fear will follow. If we do not stop them now, they're going to continue with this war all over the world. No one sort of paid attention until all of a sudden we wake up in, 2000, in 2001, really. We wake up and they're running the government. They own the Defense Department. I mean, that's what's well, so terrifying. You thought that the war was going to spread all over the Middle East. You thought there'd be massive bloodshed. It hasn't happened, has it? Really? Not yet. Yeah, it's only been three weeks. It My has. God. Look, that's what we have to worry about. I mean, really, we have to. St it's been three weeks, and we're not in Syria yet. But already in the American media, you're saying, "Oh, you're Syria, Syria, bad. Look out for Syria." It's like they're preparing us. He's right Downtown, J. Mark's band of protesters are joined by 30,000 others. They're protesting against a war they see as the start of a new American empire, against a policy of exporting democracy that only seems to target regions where American interests are at stake. The accusation in, in Arab circles, and some people in Washington say this as well, but generally they're too, too polite to put it this way, but let me say it anyway, is that the administration has been hijacked by a small group of often pro-Zionist intellectuals without any real popular backing who've somehow persuaded President Bush to go to war with Iran. No, contrary no to popular belief, no there conspiracy. is no conspiracy. Um, and uh, the group would not have been so powerful was it not for an administration and a president who is susceptible and is willing to adopt vorhin eine Möglichkeit mit dem Lkw-Fahrer zu sprechen, um, der in dem Lkw saß, auf den der Bus aufgefahren